So now I don't mean the entropy of the pub and, and, and Manchester and the rest of uh, um, our planet. I really just mean the, the, the container that holds this substance. So that's what ADM participate allows you. And it's a fully, fully general statement. If you rule out this, that suffices and it's equivalent to the second law of, of thermodynamics. So if you think of LOCC as being the equivalent of these adiabatic transformations, uh, then, then they say that entanglement can only go down, whereas adiabatic transformations make entropy go up. And since I was kind of claiming that entanglement is quantified by entropy, the question is, what's going on? You know? and is there a contradiction there? Are there two different areas of time? Um, and, and, and the answer is that they are not. Um, and, and actually, because of the whole structure, somehow both of these errors are, are a possible way of, of saying the same thing. So it's a bit like defining your entropy with a negative sign, um, which is, I think, how some of these guys worked in the early days. I think Gibbs might have defined it with a, with a negative sign compared to what we, Boltzmann certainly did. So his H theorem says that H always decreases, but his H was the minus of our H, if you like, so, so that's the same, the same statement. Um, and so, you know, it tells you there is a directionality, but whether it goes up or down really depends on how you define your function. And I think that's effectively what, what, the, answer, what the answer will be here. Um, so I want to give you probably an example just to explain how there is no, no contradiction. And then I'll switch to this more general way of talking about the second law. Highly mathematical, but I think it's, it's going to serve the purpose that, um, uh, that, uh, that I want to basically introduce in the, in the last part of the lecture. So le let, me, um, let me talk about that for, for the moment. I completely, and several people ask me this, just because of the time restrictions, I completely neglect, neglected mixed states. And, and they would require much more time because the irreversibility that we discussed in the finite case for pure states already exists uh, for mixed states in the, even in the infinite case. So the entropy already fails there for mixed state. You have to become smarter. You have to use some other functions. And you may even have to um, add something to your LOCC and so on. So the picture becomes much, uh, much less clean. Um, and in fact, you can argue that that the distillation of, of entanglement and then going backwards are already uh, uh, an irreversible kind of set of transformations for, for mixed states. Um, and the other thing I didn't really talk about is, is um, some of you may have heard, um, so now I'll tell you what I won't tell you about in a, in a way, but just for completeness. The other instance that people talk about frequently is that it seems as though in, in quantum thermodynamics entropies can become negative as well. Um, these are only conditional entropies, really. And various people use that as, as witnesses of entanglement. So somehow, this is again another way of saying maybe entanglement can be used to violate the second law. And in this case, the statement is that if you get something that has negative entropy, that's a bit like reducing entropy of, of your initial state, and that should be something that, uh, that contradicts uh, uh, quantum, uh, thermodynamics. And, and I only want to make the comment that this, this is not the case, um, and, um, and, and it's really only a question of how to define entropies properly so that they always come out positive. But the person, I mean, I'll just, this is how much I will say about it. The person who, who realized this first was, was Lindblad, uh, and this is probably the biggest contribution to uh, to entropy and measurement and correlations after, after Everett. So Lindblad, um, Lindblad used a more, a more general setting, and I think he was the first person to realize that, that if he uses the von Neumann version of, of, of correlations, so basically if you have a state like A00 plus B11, which is what we talked about, uh, he, said, uh, he said something like, if I, if I uh, if I look at if I look at the mutual information as defined with von Neumann entropies, then this would be defined something like entropy of, of A and plus entropy of B minus entropy of A B. And and this this entity, um, in fact, um, because the whole state is pure, this this entropy is zero. And S A and S B are equal to one another because this is a completely symmetric state. 
So A has to be correlated to B as much as B is correlated to A in, in some sense. So what you get is you get twice the, the entropy uh, of this guy. So this is what Lindbergh wrote down. And then he said, if on the other hand I had classically correlated um, probability, this classical bits, then the best I could do, since there are no superpositions in, in classical physics, the best I can do is mimic this by some kind of mixed state of this kind. So I kill the off diagonal elements, if you like, and I have a state like that. And then he said, if I compute the mutual information here, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm just gonna add Q here to say this is the quantum mutual information. And the classical one would again be the entropy of A plus the entropy of me, B minus the AB, but the AB is now mixed. I've got, I've got entropy coming from the joint probability distribution. And in fact, it's equal to, to both of these. So, so what you get classically is just a single instance of this, not twice. Um, and, and Lindblad notices this. Um, uh, I think he was the first person in one of his papers. This was before he became the Lindblad of the Lindblad master equation. This was his PhD. Um, uh, I think he was invited to speak about this. And be between the invitation and the meeting, he came up with the Lindblad master equation. And he emailed the organizer saying whatever. He posted some letter saying, I, uh, I have something infinitely better than, than this, and I'd rather speak about that. But I think this was, this was uh, probably a more interesting contribution in some level. And I think he notes, and he says, why is there a factor of two between quantum correlations and classical correlations? And his answer, this is a one-line answer, it's clearly because of entanglement. So this state is entangled. Well, this state is not entangled. So Lindblad says entanglement equals uh, IQ minus IC. Um, and, and he was almost right. Um, in fact, he was right. It's just that he was looking at pure states. If he bothered to start with a mixed state, then this is something we would call discord now. Um, and, and, and there is lots of work about really linking quantities of this type to thermodynamics as well. And in fact, Zurek was probably the, the person to offer Maxwell's demons based on this code and so on. But the negative, the negative, the negative entropy would arise would arise in a way if you if you switch these two. So in a sense, negative entropy would come from from some kind of conditional entropy of one subsystem conditioned on the state of the other subsystem. And I think if you really follow the classical prescription of calculating this, uh, this conditional entropy. So if you say something like conditional entropy of A given system B, this is defined as something like SAB minus SB <coughs> or minus SA, whichever. And, and, and quantum mechanically, classically this is impossible because classically the joint entropy has always got to be at least as big as either of the marginal entropies. You can't have a total state being less mixed than, than the subsystems. So classically, this is always a positive quantity. If you do it quantum mechanically, then the entropy of the whole state can be zero, as in this case, while the, the, the subsystem is mixed. So quantum mechanically, you can, actually, you can actually have a negative value there. But all this tells you, so I just want to make a quick comment on why this is, so you know, now you can say, oh wow, I've got a negative entropy. Does that mean that I can use this entangled state to have some work cycle, which gives me more work than otherwise allowed, uh, allowed by Carnot? And the answer is no, because you didn't really define your conditional entropy properly. All this says is that this is not a good definition of conditional entropy. And if you define it properly, you will not get any contradiction. And lots of this work is really related to how to, um, how to define this code and so on. So there, there's, a, there's a bunch of things I'm really ignoring, which are interesting. So what negative entropy really means is that you can, you can do work with your system but if you're entangled to it, you can also then use the, the measurement apparatus to do extra work. So this negative entropy tells you that at the end of the process, when your system has completed the work, there's still something left uh, in your whatever drove this uh, cycle. And this is, of course, impossible, classically speaking. But quantum mechanically, there is no violation of the second law because if you look at the total entropy of the whole thing, of the whole universe, you never get a de decrease in entropy. 
you only get something uh, relative to this, providing you define it in this way. So this is really just a matter of, uh, of definition. So let me go back to, to, the, to the instance of, um, of, of comparing uh, entropy and entropy. Um, so basically what happens is this. Um, I'll, I'll go back to this example where, where a, a maximally entangled state goes to, um, by LOCC, goes to some less entangled state. And what happens uh, now is, is, so this contains all the mystery in the sense that my reduced entropy, so it looks like I'm going from one pure state to another pure state. So if I look at the entropy of, of, of this state, psi, um, or I call it phi plus, I think. So if I, if I look at the entropy of phi plus and, and I look at the entropy of psi afterwards, uh, they are both zero. All I've done is I've gone from one pure state to another pure state. Um, so that's fine. I mean, entropy can stay constant. There's no problem in that. But locally, it looks as though I have a problem because I'm going from a qubit analysis side that's maximally mixed. So the entropy of this is, is, uh, is uh, one unit, if you like. And I'm going to something that's less mixed than that. Um, and, and so the entropy afterwards is certainly less than one. Um, and the question is, the question is, yes, I've decreased entanglement, um, but now it seems I've also decreased the entropy because I'm using, so this is like entanglement in this case, the same. Uh, and it seems to go in the opposite direction as, as the entropy. And the answer to that is that this is the case because you're not looking at the apparatus that was needed to achieve something like that. And I'll show you very simply by extent. So this is this church of higher Hilbert space, so to speak. If, if I include the description of how I went from here to here, then you will see that I needed to attach an ancilla. In fact, you know it because that's how we did it. I needed to attach two ancillas here, perform some measurements to do teleportation, and as soon as I have measurements, I've increased the entropy of, of my universe automatically. So there is no question about the fact that the total entropy goes, goes up. The only thing is that it looks as though it goes down because I'm not looking at the total universe. It's just a simple mistake. I'm not doing it properly. I'm not using the right version of the second law. And that's the simple answer. So let me just spell it out. Here. So basically, you would start with a state like that. And the maximally, so this would be all Alice's side. And one of these qubits would also be Alice and the other would be Bob. Uh, <coughs> and, and what you do then is you make a set of belt projections on Alice's side, on this qubit and this qubit. So this is now projected. And remember what it means to be projected. So now I'm going to lift it all by, by all to the whole universe and make the whole thing into a kind of Everett star scheme. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about projections at all. All I'm going to do is add an extra ancilla. And the ancilla is going to be a four level system, which is going to entangle itself so as to reduce these two qubits to an effective Bell state measurement. So I can always represent. Uh, a projected measurement as a unitary transformation at a higher level by adding more, more ancillas. And what this means is that after you projected these guys, your ancilla here has, has now changed from a pure state, so there will be some ancilla that I'm going to call measurement apparatus M. And this guy will generate four different states, M1, M2, M3, and M4. Each of these states will correlate to a different Bell state to which you can project this. So it's a, it's a big superposition. You know, there would be one Bell state here, there would be phi minus here, there would be psi plus and psi minus. And, and when you do this projection, you are converting a pure state ancilla into an equal mixture, one quarter probability of these four states. So actually your entropy has gone up by two bits during this protocol in the whole universe. So there is no contradiction. So the reason why it looks as though there is a contradiction is because you're not looking at the whole universe and how you've executed the whole, the whole transformation.
there. And there's a general statement to, to, to make in this case. So imagine, imagine, so, okay, let me, let me, let me just, let me just summarize this. There's a very nice intuitive way um, of, of how you can, of how you can talk about this in terms of majorization. Now, the reason why I'm going to do it in terms of majorization is because I was using single copy here and I want to show you that this works even in the finite case. It's not just in, uh, it's not, you don't need to have ensembles to make this, it holds for ensembles as well. It's just that you're generating even more entropy because you need an ancilla for every pair that you need to teleport in, in this way. So it generates quite a lot of, quite a lot of entropy. Um, and, and in majorization, if you go, if you, if you want to um, execute the transform, so basically, um, let's suppose that you have again two states, uh, sigma and, and rho, and let's suppose that rho is more mixed, um, but now more mixed, not just entropically speaking, but in terms of majorization. So if you remember what this means, is that the eigenvalues, the spectrum of this guy, if you arrange it in the decreasing order, uh, is bigger. So all of these sub uh, sums are bigger in the case of sigma than in the case of rho. So you basically have to compare the largest eigenvalue of, of uh, this matrix with this one, uh, then the next two up, uh, and so on and so on. And what this means is if this happens to be true, then this state is, is more pure than, than that state. And the interesting thing for us in quantum mechanics, and I think that's gonna, that's gonna resolve quite a lot of these issues, is that this is equivalent to the following statement. There exists an observable and a unitary transformation such that um, rho equals to sigma transformed unitarily and then project it onto some basis. So there is an orthogonal basis. That means there is a there is a Hermitian operator with with this kind of spectrum, and these are the eigen eigen values. So basically, if you take the most general quantum evolution, you can rotate your state unitarily, and then you can make some projective measurement. What this says is that getting from sigma to rho is equivalent to sigma being more pure in terms of majorization than rho. But it's if and only if. So that's really powerful. If I cannot find u and, and projections, then there is no relation between these two. As soon as I can, this is true. And as soon as this is true, I can find unitary and p. So this way of describing mixing processes is very suitable to quantum mechanics because that's all we ever do in quantum mechanics. Of course, now you can say, what happened to P of the M's? Didn't you say that you can do more, more general measurements than, than, than is projected? The answer is yes, but a P of the M can always be extended to a high Hilbert space by adding more and more ancillas and then making it into a projective measurement. So this really is all there is to quantum mechanics if you're prepared to enlarge, enlarge your system. And so now what this says is that the, if you like the mixedness or the entropy, the entropy of this, uh, of this state is higher. So that's certainly a consequence of majorization. It's not the same, but it says the entropy of rho is greater than or equal to the entropy of, of sigma. So sigma is more pure. However, if you look at each of these individual states on their own, if you say, oh, wait a second, I can write this as sum of some probabilities Pn times some states um, rho n. So if you get outcome P1, your state is projected onto some state rho 1. If you get P2, it's rho 2 and whatever else you get. So this works for a generalized measurement as, as well, which is why I'm writing it as a, as a mixed state. Then the entropy of the whole state is higher than the initial one, but the entropy of each of these states here is lower than the initial one. So if I make a measurement and I look at my result, I'm reducing entropy of that system. And so that's what I'm trying to say. When you're manipulating entanglement, so the entropy of each of these row ends 
happens to be less than or equal to the entropy of the input state. If I mix them all, then I increase the entropy. But if I look at them individually, then I lower the entropy. And I think that's all there is to two different directions. This is actually what happens in entanglement manipulations. You make a measurement, and conditional on your measurement, you do something to your system. So you know the outcome. And it looks as though superficially you are reducing entropy or reducing entanglement. But actually, if you acknowledge that the way you did this is with an extra ancilla, which is correlated to the whole state. So there is the rest of the universe in a state n, which is 100% correlated to your projective measurement. Then the whole entropy of this, of this guy always goes up. You can never get an entropy decrease in your case. So basically, all there is to these different errors is that one of them comes from the fact that when I make a measurement, I check the result and the outcome. And because I gain the information, I'm bound to lower the, the mixedness. So everything I said here incidentally holds for, for majorization, not just for entropy itself. It's a very general statement in any finite case. It implies entropy, but, but not, uh, but not vice, uh, vice versa. So basically, um, the two pictures are one and the same. And, and the, the only reason why there seems to be a discrepancy between, between these pictures is because when we manipulate entanglement, we don't care about the rest of the universe. We only care about the state that we, that we manipulate. Uh, but otherwise, there is no, there is no, there is no problem there. So I don't know if, if, this, makes it, uh, if this makes it clear, but, but just to emphasize again, the, 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 analogy, the analogy works at every level. So any finite number of copies, all you need to do, of course, then is, is, is think in terms of majorization or any entropies and not in terms of, not in terms of just the, the von Neumann, the von Neumann entropy. So all of this, all of this is, uh, is fine. Um, and that's somehow comforting to know because um, it's, it's, it's really comforting to know in the sense that um, in the sense that it would be really weird if quantum, uh, if quantum mechanics um, said something different as far as reversibility is concerned to classical mechanics. And that's what I probably want to comment on now before I go into the wild uh, 20 minutes at the end. So basically, um, the standard, so we know that you cannot really explain the entropy increase from reversible dynamics. So if you only look at the total universe, and if you believe that the universe is described by quantum mechanics and it's a closed system, which seems to make sense, then the entropy of the universe actually always stays the same. Zero or infinity or 42, whatever is your definition of, of entropy, you can risk it. But it's always the same. It just evolves unitarily. You can't change the entropy of, of your universe. <coughs> and of course, if you want to get a genuine increase in entropy, then you have to do something, you have to introduce a fudge into your calculations. And it's just as simple as that. There is no getting away from that. Some of these arguments, you can say, are, are physically um, and maybe intuitively clear that it should be like that. But ultimately, all you're doing is introducing asymmetry by hand. So in terms of entanglement, what we did is, is we insisted on local operations. So we already restricted our operations. If I gave you any operation I, I wanted globally, then you can convert anything you like into anything else. There is no restriction of, of any type. But basically, if I impose a, a restriction, then automatically you get certain irreversibility there. And of course, the other restriction I imposed was really on the, on the finiteness of, of these copies. So even LOCCs are reversible if you allow, if you allow an infinite ensemble of, uh, of pure states. And in general, it's quite neat because all of this entropy increase ultimately goes uh, into ignoring correlations. And I think that's another nice link. Because I mentioned earlier that um, Everett talked about decreasing correlations. And I said that's really an instance of entropy increase. But I didn't really, I didn't really show that. And I will show you that now. So, so at the most general level, you start with your system, and then you have the rest of the universe. I don't know how to call it. Let's call it really like rho sub r. And I include as much as is relevant, 
as much of the universe that couples to my system. And, and now you say, okay, at that level, if the whole thing is, is isolated, and if you include enough here, it will be isolated, then really the, 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 the evolution of that is just some big um, unitary transformation that can do anything to the two subsystems. So in general, this would be something that will correlate them. It's unlikely that this would be a product of unitary one and the other. In general, they will somehow collide, they will exchange their states or whatever, there will be a state swap or something. And so your final state will be some state that you will not be able to write as a product state. But then, if you, if you say, oh, but these guys are unlikely to collide again. So for me to go back from this state into that state, it's equivalent to time reversal at some stage. So what I would have to do is I would have to take this state as an input state, apply u dagger, or u2 minus 1, and that's going to take me back to this state. So it's clear that it's reversible at that level. There is nothing irreversible there. But now imagine that these guys never meet again. So think of that as two atoms. They collide, and then they off they go into infinity colliding with other things. So anything that follows from now on is an LOCC. They never meet again. So what that means is that for all practical purposes, and I emphasize this for all practical purposes, this is a product state. That's the Boltzmann fudge. Okay? Let's come here. And then he had all sorts of all sorts of um, criticisms from people like Lockschmidt who said to him, What if I reverse the whole thing? And then Boltzmann said, here is a gas, go ahead and reverse it. You know, you've got 10 to the power of 23 atoms. Why don't you reverse it? <laughs> and you see, that's another fudge. I'm making the past and the future different by hand. Um, it's, a slight, it's, it, 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 it's a trick. There is nothing out there. So in principle, I can possibly do that. It might be difficult, but there is nothing really in principle wrong with it. But now the interesting conclusion I want to draw here. The entropy of, of this initial state, it, it, it's in fact nice because entropies are ad additive. So this is just the sum of the entropies of the system plus the entropy of the rest of the universe. And the unitary transformation, as I said, preserves this. So the final state has got to have, this goes for majorization as well. Every time I write S, you could put S sub alpha is true for all alphas as well. So basically, I have, I have this. But now, I've deliberately killed all the correlations between system and the rest. And as you know, and it's intuitively clear, what that leads to is entropy increase. This is called subadditivity, or whatever it's called in, in, in inequalities in entropy. So this is less than or equal to the entropy of the reduced state here, plus the entropy of the reduced state over there. So all I did to get this state is I traced out R, and I obtained this state. Then I traced out S, and I obtained that state. And I pretend that that's my state. And that's OK if these guys never meet again. If they do, anything can happen. Um, and now look, entropy increase. If I put this on the other side, and this on the other side, what this says is that the change in entropy of the system, which is this minus this, plus the change in the entropy of the reservoir, which is of the rest, this, this minus this, is actually a positive on the second law. That's all there is to Boltzmann's derivation. Okay. Um, he, called it, he called it the assumption of molecular chaos. Ignoring correlations amounts to some kind of chaotic behavior of your, of your moment. And as far as I know, that's really the only way. But what's nice here is the message to us that, that you trade it. So, you know, how did I get entropy increase from something that actually preserves entropy? And what you deleted is exactly the mutual information between, between, between the system and the rest at the end. So if you think about the mutual information, it's defined as the entropy of rho s prime plus the entropy of rho rest prime minus the entropy of the, of the whole thing. So 
this is what I claim is the final entropy if you ignore correlations. This is the real final entropy. And the difference between the two is something that's always a positive quantity. That you got over here. So I kill correlations. And, and some, some people call this coarse graining. So I don't look at the whole thing. I kind of extract bits of my system. And then, of course, you lose information, as you see. And of course, you increase entropy. So this is the only way, as far as I know, uh, how people argue for, for irreversibility. Um, so in some sense, there is really no conflict. And I think, um, again, you can apply the same story and, and say, um, by local operations, you will only be decreasing this kind of mutual information, which, in fact, amounts to generating more and more entropy as you kill more and more mutual information. So the two look superficial and like they're going in the opposite direction sometimes, but actually they go in the same direction if you take if you take the whole thing. Okay, now the final the final crazy bit is but I like use it. Um, why do why do why do I think this is interesting? I think this is interesting because um, <coughs> There are probably there are probably two different extreme opinions as to as to the importance of of thermodynamics. So some people would say thermodynamics is really just a derivative of something that's more fundamental. The way I did it here. So basically, you start with the exact dynamics, then you introduce some kind of uh, sleight of hand, and out comes increasing entropy. So that's a consequence of your understanding of dynamics and being careless with all the details of the dynamics. So thermodynamics is a derivative of that. And that would make it weaker than the microscopic dynamics. But then there is this other story which comes from the way that physics has evolved, which is to say that it seems to be that thermodynamics holds almost independently of the dynamical theory that we have. Mm -hmm. so this entropy increase, I, 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 I really phrased the whole thing in terms of density matrices. But you could have taken classical probability distribution, classical Hamilton equations, and you would derive exactly the same. That was Boltzmann's derivation. He didn't have any quantum mechanics there. So that's exactly the classical argument that he used. And there is no difference. So it looks interesting that even though the, the theory changes in a huge way, um, so fundamentally, the world described by quantum mechanics is completely different. Somehow, um, thermodynamics doesn't even notice that. So Einstein liked it. He called it a meta theory for that reason. So it's something that's imposed from above. And any other theory has to satisfy it. That's, again, the Eddington way of talking about it. So if you come up with a new theory, you violate thermodynamics, that's it. Forget about it. You know, because this has to hold. Why it has to hold is not obvious at all. Um, and, and I think that's where the speculations come in. But it's certainly the way that, uh, that quantum, quantum mechanics evolved. And I think if you're into this kind of relationship between entropy and area and Bekenstein bounds and all of these, uh, all of these things, people believe that even, even you know, a way that, 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 that may be um, um, possible to quantize gravity is simply to look at these entropic connections between different aspects of, of your theory. So, so I think some people believe that thermodynamics may play. So if, if you're asking yourself, OK, you know, I can't quantize gravity. So I have some bits of quantum mechanics that are correct, but I have to reject others. And I have some bits of, of uh, general relativity that are correct, but I have to reject others. Then how do I do that? And this was the same question that Einstein faced when he had Newton's laws and, and Maxwell's electrodynamics. He said both of them look evidently correct. But when I put them, uh, when I, when I put them together, basically, I've got a problem. So what should, I, what should I keep there? And the same question was there for Planck, saying that if I use statistical mechanics classically uh, based on Newton's laws, and again, try to derive black body spectrum, I won't be able to do it. So what shall I, how shall I pick and mix it? which bits are correct and which bits should be, should be dropped. And he said, those that have thermodynamical favor are the ones I'm going to keep, because they trust in the second law of thermodynamics. It's an interesting way of arguing. And so now the question is, can you do the same over again? Can you say the ones that, that are somehow closest to, 
So some kind of entropic logic uh, should be the ones that, uh, that should be kept. So here's an interesting idea. Um, like I said, this is, this is something that David Deutsch uh, has been promoting probably in a different, in a different way. Um, uh, I, I distilled something that can probably be converted into a mathematically well-defined question, but I'm not even sure yeah. about that. But, but I think it's an interesting one. So for me to tell you that, I need to give you a, a five minute um, intro into another uh, formulation of uh, uh, second law. Uh, so this is due to a, a Greek German um, mathematician called Karatiodori. I think he was a friend of Max Born. And Max Born went to him in 19 or whatever, eight or nine, and said to him, uh, listen, Constantine, I'm very dissatisfied with the way that thermodynamics is phrased. It seems to be phrased like a very fluffy physics theory. I want it to be put on a firmer mathematical foundation, just like uh, Newton's laws or, or electrodynamics or anything else. And, and this is, of course, the right person to ask because he's a mathematician and he may be able to formalize things better than, uh, than we can. And, and, and his version of the, of the second law um, goes like this. Um, so it's fully compatible with other versions, and I think I will just show you that very briefly just to convince you that this really is the case. Um, so his, his statement was, okay, I mean, his statement goes like this. Um, he said, if you take, if you restrict yourself to adiabatic processes, and if you take any state of your physical system, so think about a gas, and you, you give me the pressure, the volume, the temperature, you specify a, a point, if you like, and, and what he says that, that in, in, the, in the neighborhood of any state of this system, there have to be states which cannot be adiabatically reached from that state. So basically he says um, there is a, for every state, there, there are states in, in any neighborhood of that state that you can never get to if you isolate the system thermally from the environment. That's the physical way. Now obviously you can see how this this is a very tight formulation because it implies Kelvin and Clausius and Carnot and whoever else. But it's more minimalistic in a sense. Now physicists of course tend to dislike it. You know, Planck, Planck made uh, a number of, um, a number of um, kind of funny comments about it. Um, and, and one of them is simply that it's difficult to physically see how to violate this, uh, this statement. So you know, if, if you think about another formulation uh, then it says that you cannot have a cycle uh, which basically um, takes uh, heat from, um, from a cold reservoir, shoves it into a hot reservoir without any other effect in the universe. So there is no closed cycle like that. So any fridge has got to have work coming from electricity. You have to plug it into something. Otherwise, it, it's, it's not going to work. And that's easy to violate. All you need to do is show me a cycle that does exactly contrary to the statement. Just give me two reservoirs, show me that heat goes in the opposite direction, and that's it. You violated the second law. I mean, of course, you know that there are so many lunatics who keep trying this even, even these days. It's, it's an easy statement to try to violate, at least. Here, I, I said in the vicinity of, you know, I can phrase this with epsilons and deltas just to make even more fun of it. So, you know, in any epsilon environment, no matter how small epsilon is, of any point, you will find at least one point which cannot be reached adiabatically from that point. So how do you violate a statement like that? I mean, how do you construct, what, what do you need to construct to, uh, to, go, uh, to go in the opposite direction? But somehow, it happens to be equivalent to the other formulation. So let me just show you, let me just show you, show you how, this, how this works. Um, Think of, um, think of an example. Um, so, so what I'm gonna what I'm gonna try to show you now is that is that it's really the same as the statement of Kelvin, which says which says you cannot convert all the heat into work without any other effect. So again, formally stated, you can't have a closed cycle which converts all the heat input into work without dumping some heat anywhere else. So there has to be some other change in the environment, otherwise you can't do that. 
that's equivalent to the Clausius statement of, of different temperatures. And, and, and basically, if you think about Karatiotis, <coughs> so think about the internal energy as one, as one, um, as, as one uh, variable in your, in your system. So I'm gonna draw some kind of space of thermodynamical states. And this other coordinate could be, could be all the spatial coordinate, like volume. Think about the volume here, for example. I can bunch all the other mechanical variables. I can change the length or whatever else of, of, my, of my system. And now I've got, um, and now I've got um, some point here which has certain internal energy and it has certain volume. And now Karatiodori Car says there has to be at least one point in any neighborhood. Okay? So this is the state of your system, if you like, S0. Here is a neighborhood. I'm drawing it big just so that you can see what's going on. But he says no matter how small this tiny neighborhood, you've got to be able to find at least one state which cannot be reached. I mean, we know the answer. That's the state with lower entropy. You can't go to lower entropy adiabatic. You can only increase entropy. That's the, the beer argument, right, from Manchester. So that's it. That's what he's saying. And it's clear that it's only going to go in one direction. So basically, in order to show that this is the same as, um, as Kelvin, you exactly suppose otherwise. And you say, what if all of these, what of these all of these points basically can um, can be reached um, can be reached in in, um, in some in some shape or form. So basically, what you do is you have another point, which you assume has the same volume as as your point, but you start from from some lower energy than than the initial than the initial point, um, and now. Let's say I allow the heat to go into the system. So I can always pump in heat, keep the volume constant, and what this is going to do is raise the internal energy of your system. So here I pumped all the heat, and I went from the point S1 to the point S0. Now I isolate the system, and because I've assumed the opposite of Karatiodori, I can go backwards adiabatically because I can reach this point adiabatically. I'm assuming the opposite of Karatiodori. Here is a closed cycle that converts all the heat into work without anything else. Bang! I'm contradicting Kelvin immediately. Okay? So basically, by assuming that, uh, that there are no points here which are inaccessible, to my point, I violated Kelvin's statement of the second. That immediately means I violated Carnot and Clausius and all the other second law formulations. So this was Carl Theodore's statement. And it's very powerful, and various people have used this kind of this kind of logic. Um, so what he would then say is all when you're given lots of points uh, of your of your system, it could be in some kind of space like that. All this really tells you is the direction, so entropy tells you the directionality that adiabatic processes can take. So they tell you that you can go from this point to this point, and maybe like that, but you cannot go in the backwards direction. So once you give me all the points and you give me all the arrows, you fully define <coughs> the thermodynamics of my system. And you've showed me basically that there is a parameter, which we call entropy, which tells you um, the error of time in some sense. It says things can go this way, but they cannot really go the, the opposite way. And also from this formal, formal definition, you can see that if I reverse all of these arrows, it's still fine. It's the same formulation. But it looks like the error of time is going in the opposite direction. And there is no inconsistency. I'm just using the different functions to order my states. But they're still ordered in the same way still the same order the switch sign, but that's fine. So entanglement, if you like, if you think of these states as entangled states, was in the exact, uh, in the exact process. Right? So now I want, to, I, want to, I want to say something that I, that I think is interesting in, 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 regarding going beyond quantum mechanics. 
Um, so if you really, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to really support this very strongly. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I belong to this uh, class of people myself. But suppose that, that somehow we are taking the logic of thermodynamics is underpinning everything in this universe. It's been very successful so far. Nothing is violated. Why not, why not take that as, as the ultimate thing, you know? And ask, do you, how, much, how much more do you actually need to divide the rest of physics? Do you actually need anything on top of it? to this kind of logic in order to be able to derive everything else. Why just partly? Why not the full thing? Can it really follow from, from some kind of thermodynamics? And of course, I don't know the answer to that. It would be nice if it did. Um, you can also be very skeptical and have arguments otherwise. But I think one idea is, is the following idea. So, so lots of people have frequently wondered um, how tight the whole structure of quantum mechanics is. So this is again probably a topic that, that, that Rob Speckens um, could uh, tell you much more about than I can. But it so happens that when you tweak quantum mechanics by even the smallest amount in any direction, so you take the Schrodinger equation and you say, why unitary? Why don't I add a little nonlinearity somewhere? then you automatically run into trouble. So that's another frustration about quantum mechanics, that even if you believe that it doesn't describe all the phenomena, somehow it's very difficult to change it. Of course, quantizing gravity is one of those, one of those issues, that, that you have a nonlinear theory, and you're trying to impose a linear theory on top of that nonlinear theory. So some people then say, well, that shows that the quantum mechanics should also be nonlinear. But whenever you do that, you actually start to contradict things like the second law of thermodynamics. And that's because nonlinearity allows you to do things like discriminate two states that are very close to one another. If you, if you allow nonlinearity to act on that, they can become orthogonal ultimately. And so quantum mechanics says you can't discriminate states that are very close to one another. I mean, this is Heisenberg's uncertainty, if you like. But if you had a nonlinear extension, you can make them orthogonal. And you can then use this to violate the second law as well, because now I've got two states, and I can discriminate them better than my theory says I can discriminate them. And immediately, thermodynamics is out of the window. Uh, and in fact, even people of the caliber of, of Steven Weinberg, the Nobel laureate, the, the grand unification, he wrote a paper where he suggested a nonlinear extension. And then one of our guys, in this case, Gizan, Nicola Gizan, wrote a one-page comment saying this can't be right because it violates the second law. And then Weinberg said, I can't believe how stupid I was. You know, it's, it's a very simple mistake. And yes. So, but this l leads lots of people to, to be frustrated because whichever way you tweak it, this is n not really true of classical mechanics. You can tweak classical mechanics in many ways. It's still going to be OK with the rest of physics in some sense. But if you tweak quantum mechanics, it seems that you suddenly start to violate everything else, you know, in particular, of course, second law, which is, which is our, our main topic. And so one way to try to marry these two pictures, one of them is this kind of formulation of, of thermodynamics, and the other one is physics, is maybe to phrase all physical processes in the current theodory way. So this is the David Birch logic. I think he still hasn't put this paper up. I hope he's OK with the fact that I'm kind of talking about it. I think what I have to say and the way I'm saying it is sufficiently different to what you will read probably when it comes out, that you won't even recognize the similarity. But, but, but the logic is this. How about I don't phrase my physics dynamically with differential equations, which is what we've been used to for the last 350 years, ever since Newton, I suppose. But how about we phrase it in terms of what are the processes in nature that are allowed and what kind of transformations are not allowed? So I give, you, I give you, I don't know, x amount of water, y amount of beer, you know, z amount of whatever. And I ask you, is there a process to convert it into k amount of gold, q amount of, so I really phrase it just like thermodynamics. I give you all the states and all the possible processes. And I tell you which processes are allowed and, and which processes are not allowed. That should suffice. It's an equivalent way of talking about physics. I just describe everything that can happen in this 
in this universe. And I think David believes this is the way to, to go. But here is an interesting point, actually. So, how would I, what would be the second law now? How would I elevate the second law to actually describe the ultimate law of physics? And the nice speculation could be completely wrong is to say exactly this, in the vicinity, so your points now are not going to be thermodynamical states, but they will be processes themselves. So in the vicinity of every possible physical process, there is a process that's impossible physically. Here's the current other statement, and it reflects the tightness of quantum mechanics. It says your ultimate theory is so tight that if you move an epsilon away, how do I define an epsilon? I've got no idea when it comes to dynamical theories. That's why I don't know how to convert even this into mathematics. I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic idea. So every physical possible process is a point, and if you move a little bit away, you will always be able to find something that makes no sense, that's impossible. Is this principle sufficient to give me the ultimate laws of physics? Is this what gives it? And I think it's an amazing idea. So this would elevate thermodynamics to the highest pedestal, so to speak. Here is the law, okay? It's kind of current order regionalization to processes, and that's it. And if this happens to be quantum mechanics, great, you know? We have a, we have a second law generalization that tells us that quantum mechanics is that theory, uh, which if you tweak by an epsilon, you get rubbish. But but I have a feeling it's not going to be quantum mechanics, if, that, if that's the statement. You know, maybe you can get something tighter than that. And it really just intrigues me. So what I've just summarized in these five minutes is everything I know about it. I have no idea how to go about it and how to even play with these theories and move them a little bit um, from one point of validity and show that you get into something that, but I think the contradiction you're looking for when you move away is something like the violation of the of the second law. So you have to have something that rules out physical processes at some level. But I think it's an intriguing idea because it somehow says all these analogies between quantum physics, entanglement, and thermodynamics, they're not just superficially there. You should think of them as something much more fundamental which generates all of them at the same time. I think it's, it's, it's really an interesting idea. But like I said, uh, you can probably safely forget the last 20 minutes and, and it will not hurt you. The rest of your career. Thanks a lot. So, have we got any questions? You know, you're considering uh, discrete properties Someone already asked me that, and I don't know the answer. The paper I quoted only gives the uh, the discrete case. Uh, so probably for you know for continuous variables, you would have to check probably again a continuum of different uh, cuts of of your probability density. So you know you would have to probably integrate your probability density um, up to a higher and higher limit. But I don't know if there is a simpler way of not having to do the full thing. And I even don't know whether this thing is equivalent to, to majorization and all the other issues. So I, I have not seen anything on that. Sorry, I think sir, lock up in five minutes. Thank you. Okay. I think it's an interesting question because especially when you go in, into continuous variable entanglement manipulations and you have two modes of light and you start discussing where you can put then of course you may encounter some of these issues as well. Yeah. Okay, maybe in the interest of us not being locked yes. in here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank you again.